Section 16 of John Brown by W. E. B. Du Bois. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. The Blow. Part 1. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil. At eight o'clock on Sunday evening, Captain Brown said, Men, get on your arms, we will proceed to the ferry. His horse and wagon were brought out before the door, and some pikes, a sledgehammer, and a crowbar were placed in it. The captain then put on his old Kansas cap and said, Come, boys, when we marched out of the camp behind him into the lane leading down the hill to the main road. The orders given commanded Owen Brown, Merriam, and Barclay Coppock to watch the house in arms until ordered to bring them toward the ferry. Tid and Cook were to cut the telegraph lines, and Coggy and Stevens to detain the bridge guard. Watson Brown and Taylor were to hold the bridge over the Potomac, and Oliver Brown and William Thompson the bridge over the Shenandoah. Jerry Anderson and Dauphin Thompson were to occupy the engine house in the arsenal yard, while Hazlitt and Edwin Coppock were to hold the armory. During the night, Coggy and Copeland were to seize and guard the rifle factory, and others were to go out in the country and bring in certain masters and their slaves it was a cold dark night when the band started ahead was john brown in his one-horse farm wagon with pikes a sledge-hammer and a crowbar behind him marched the men silently and at intervals cook and tid leading they had five miles to go over rolling hills and through woods and then down to a narrow road between the cliffs and the cincinnati and ohio canal as they approached the railroad cook and tid cut the telegraph wires which led to baltimore and washington at the bridge they halted and made ready their arms at ten o'clock william williams one of the watchmen there was surprised to find himself a prisoner in the hands of coggy and stevens who took him through the covered structure to the town leaving watson brown and steward taylor to guard the bridge the rest of the company entered harper's ferry the land between the rivers is itself high though dwarfed by the mountains and running down to a low point where the rivers join at this place the bridge leads to maryland after crossing the bridge to virginia about sixty yards up the street running parallel to the potomac was the gate of the armory where the arms were made on the shenandoah side about sixty yards from the armory gate is the arsenal where the arms were stored the company proceeded to the armory gate the watchman tells how the place was captured open the gate said they i said i could not if i was stuck and one of them jumped up on the pier of the gate over my head and another fellow ran and put his hand on me and caught me by the coat and held me i was inside and they were outside and the fellow standing over my head upon the pier and then when i would not open the gate for them five or six ran in from the wagon clapped their guns against my breast and told me i should deliver up the key i told them i could not and another fellow made an answer and said they had not time now to be waiting for the key but to go to the wagon and bring out the crowbar and large hammer and they would soon get in they went to the little wagon and brought a large crowbar out of it there was a large chain around the two sides of the wagon gate going in they twisted the crowbar in the chain and they opened it and in they ran and got in the wagon one fellow took me they all gathered about me and looked in my face i was nearly scared to death with so many guns about me the two captured watchmen anderson says were left in the custody of jerry anderson and dauphin thompson and a d stevens arranged the men to take possession of the armory and rifle factory about this time there was apparently much excitement people were passing back and forth in the town and before we could do much we had to take several prisoners after the prisoners were secured we passed to the opposite side of the street and took the armory and albert hazlitt and edwin coppock were ordered to hold it for the time being the other fourteen men quickly dispersed through the village oliver brown and william thompson seized and guarded the bridge across the shenandoah this bridge was sixty rods from the highway bridge up the river and was the direct route to loudon heights the slave-filled lower valley and the great black way it was however not the only way across the shenandoah a little more than half a mile farther up were the rifle works where the stream could be easily forded coggy and copeland went there captured the watchman and took possession 
these places were all taken and the prisoners secured without the snap of a gun or any violence whatever says anderson and he continues the town being taken brown stevens and the men who had no post in charge returned to the engine house where council was held after which captain stevens tidd cook shields green leary and myself went to the country on the road we met some colored men to whom we made known our purpose when they immediately agreed to join us they said they had been long waiting for an opportunity of the kind stevens then asked them to go around among the colored people and circulate the news when each started off in a different direction the result was that many colored men gathered to the scene of action the first prisoner taken by us was colonel lewis washington a relative of george washington when we neared his house captain stevens placed leary and shields green to guard the approaches to the house the one at the side the other in front we then knocked but no one answering although females were looking from upper windows we entered the building and commenced a search for the proprietor colonel washington opened his room door and begged us not to kill him captain stevens replied you are our prisoner when he stood as if speechless or petrified stevens further told him to get ready to go to the ferry that he had come to abolish slavery not to take life but in self-defense but that he must go along the colonel replied you can have my slaves if you will let me remain no said the captain you must go along too so get ready he and his male slaves were thus taken together with a large four-horse wagon and some arms including the lafayette sword away the party went and after capturing another planter and his slaves arrived at the ferry before daybreak meantime the citizens of the ferry returning late from protracted methodist meeting were being taken prisoners and about one o'clock in the morning the eastbound baltimore and ohio train arrived this was detained and the local colored porter shot dead by brown's guards on the bridge the passengers were greatly excited but at first thought it was a strike of some kind after sunrise the train was allowed to proceed john brown himself walking ahead across the bridge to reassure the conductor so monday october seventeenth began and anderson says it was a time of stirring and exciting events in consequence of the movements of the night before we were prepared for commotion and tumult but certainly not for more than we beheld around us gray dawn and yet brighter daylight revealed great confusion and as the sun arose the panic spread like wildfire men women and children could be seen leaving their homes in every direction some seeking refuge among residents and in quarters further away others climbing up the hillsides and hurrying off in various directions evidently impelled by a sudden fear which was plainly visible in their countenances or in their movements captain brown was all activity though i could not help thinking that at times he appeared somewhat puzzled he ordered louis sherard leary and four slaves and a freeman belonging in the neighborhood to join john henry coggy and john copeland at the rifle factory which they immediately did after the departure of the train quietness prevailed for a short time a number of prisoners were already in the engine house and of the many colored men living in the neighborhood who had assembled in the town a number were armed up to this point everything in john brown's plan had worked like clockwork and there had been but one death the armory was captured from twenty-five to fifty slaves had been armed several masters were in custody and the next move was to get the arms and ammunition from the farm cook says that when the party returned from the country at dawn i stayed a short while in the engine house to get warm as i was chilled through after i got warm captain brown ordered me to go with c p tidd who was to take william h lehman and i think four slaves anderson says fourteen slaves with him in colonel washington's large wagon across the river and to take terence burns and his brother and their slaves prisoners my orders were to hold burns and brother as prisoners at their own house while tidd and the slaves who accompanied him were to go to captain brown's house and to load in arms and bring them down to the schoolhouse stopping for the burnses and their guard william h lehman remained with me to guard the prisoners 
on return of the wagon in compliance with orders we all started for the schoolhouse when we got there i was to remain by captain brown's orders with one of the slaves to guard the arms while c p tidd with the other negroes was to go back for the rest of the arms and burns was to be sent with william h lehman to captain brown at the armory it was at this time that william thompson came up from the ferry and reported that everything was all right and then hurried to overtake william h lehman a short time after the departure of tidd i heard a great deal of firing and became anxious to know the cause but my orders were strict to remain in the schoolhouse and guard the arms and i obeyed the orders to the letter about four o'clock in the evening c p tidd came with the second load here in all probability was the fatal hitch the farm was not over three miles from the schoolhouse and there was a heavy farm wagon with four large strong horses and a dozen men or more to help the fact that it took these men eleven hours to move two wagon loads of material less than three miles is the secret of the extraordinary failure of brown's foray at a time when victory was in his grasp that cook was needlessly dilatory in the moving is certain he sat down in burns's house and made a speech on human equality then tidd went on to the farm with the wagon and brought a load of arms which he deposited at the point where the kennedy farm road meets the potomac almost at right angles about three miles or less from the ferry the schoolhouse stood here and the children were frightened half to death cook stopped at this place and unloaded the wagon and then lehman went with burns to the guardhouse lingering and actually sitting beside the road even then they arrived before ten o'clock with haste it is certain that despite the muddy road the first load of arms could have been at the schoolhouse before eight o'clock in the morning and the whole of the stores by ten o'clock that brown expected this is shown by his sending william thompson to reassure the men at the farm of his safety and probably to urge haste yet when the second load of arms appeared it was four o'clock in the afternoon at least three hours after brown had been completely surrounded judging from cook's narrative it is likely that thompson did not see tidd at all it was this inexcusable delay on the part of tidd and cook and possibly william thompson that undoubtedly made the raid a failure to be sure john brown never said so never hinted that any one was to blame but himself but that was john brown's way events in the town had moved quickly after cook had departed brown ordered o p anderson to take the pikes out of the wagon in which he rode to the ferry and to place them in the hands of the colored men who had come with us from the plantations and others who had come forward without having had communication with any of our party the citizens were wild with fright and excitement the prisoners were also terror-stricken some wanted to go home to see their families as if for the last time the privilege was granted them under escort and they were brought back again edwin coppock one of the sentinels at the armory gate was fired at by one of the citizens but the ball did not reach him when one of the insurgents close by put up his rifle and made the enemy bite the dust among the arms taken from colonel washington was one double-barreled gun this weapon was loaded by lehman with buckshot and placed in the hands of an elderly slave man early in the morning after the cowardly charge upon coppock this man was ordered by captain stevens to arrest a citizen the old man ordered him to halt which he refused to do when instantly the terrible load was discharged into him and he fell and expired without a struggle the next step which john brown had in mind is unknown but there were two safe movements at nine a m monday morning a the arms could have been brought across the potomac bridge and then across the shenandoah and so up loudon heights the men from the maryland side could have joined and brown and his men covered their retreat by compelling the hostages to march with them coggy and his men by waiting the shenandoah could have supported them b the arms could have been taken down to the potomac from the schoolhouse ferried across and moved over to coggy brown and his men could have joined the party there and all retreated up loudon heights from the fact that brown had the arms stopped at the schoolhouse this seems probably to have been the thought in his mind 
on the other hand the plan usually attributed to brown is unthinkable viz that he intended retreating across the potomac into the maryland mountains first he had just come out of the maryland mountains and had moved down his arms and ammunition and second this manoeuvre would have cut his band off from the great black way to the south unless he captured the ferry a second time manifestly this then was not brown's idea it has however been suggested that the arms had been moved down to the schoolhouse to be placed in the hands of slaves there but why were they left on the maryland side in the whole maryland county west of the mountains were less than a thousand able-bodied negroes of whom not a tenth could have been cognizant of the uprising while brown had arms for twelve hundred men or more no brown intended to move the arms in bulk he had perhaps a ton or a ton and a half of baggage he wished it moved first to the schoolhouse and then if all was well to the ferry or straight across to the mountains cook started before five o'clock in the morning and brown no doubt expected to hear that the arms were at the schoolhouse by ten at eleven o'clock he dispatched william thompson to kennedy farm anderson thinks that thompson's message made the farm party even more leisurely because it told of success so far this is surely impossible the veriest tyro must have known that minutes were golden despite the tremendous fortune of the expedition did thompson misapprehend his message was the delay tits and what was owen brown thinking and doing it is a curious puzzle but it is the puzzle of the foray if the party with the arms had arrived at the bridge any time before noon the raid would have been successful even as it was brown still had three courses open to him all of which promised a measure of success a he could have gotten his band and crossed back to maryland although this meant the abandonment of the main features of his whole plan as time waned stevens and coggy urged this but brown refused b he could have gone to loudon heights but this would have involved abandoning his arms and stores and above all one of his sons cook tid merriam coppock and the slaves this was unthinkable c he could have used his hostages to force terms for not doing this he afterward repeatedly blamed himself but characteristically blamed no one else for anything meantime every minute of delay aroused the country and brought the citizens to their senses the train that left harper's ferry carried a panic to virginia maryland and washington with it the passengers taking all the paper they could find wrote accounts of the insurrection which they threw from the windows as the train rushed onward a local physician says i went back to the hillside then and tried to get the citizens together to see what we could do to get rid of these fellows they seemed to be very troublesome when i got on the hill i learned that they had shot bowerly that was probably about seven o'clock i had ordered the lutheran church bell to be rung to get the citizens together to see what sort of arms they had i found one or two squirrel rifles and a few shotguns i had sent a messenger to charlestown in the meantime for captain rowan commander of a volunteer company there i also sent messengers to the baltimore and ohio railroad to stop the trains coming east and not let them approach the ferry and also a messenger to shepherdstown another eyewitness adds there was unavoidable delay in the preparations for a fight because of the scarcity of weapons for only a few squirrel guns and fowling pieces could be found there were then at harper's ferry thousands and tens of thousands of muskets and rifles of the most approved patterns but they were all boxed up in the arsenal and the arsenal was in the hands of the enemy and such too was the scarcity of the ammunition that after using up the limited supply of lead found in the village stores pewter plates and spoons had to be melted and moulded into bullets for the occasion by nine o'clock a number of indifferently armed citizens assembled on camp hill and decided that the party consisting of half a dozen men should cross the potomac a short distance above the ferry and going down the towpath of the chesapeake and ohio canal as far as the railway bridge should attack the two sentinels stationed there who by the way had been reinforced by four more of brown's party 
another small party under captain medler was to cross the shenandoah and take the position opposite the rifle works while captain avis with a sufficient force should take possession of the shenandoah bridge and captain roderick with some of the armorers should post themselves on the baltimore and ohio railway west of the ferry just above the armories at last the militia commenced to arrive and the movements to cut off brown's men began the jefferson guards crossed the potomac came down to the maryland side and seized the potomac bridge the local company was sent to take the shenandoah bridge leave a guard and march to the rear of the arsenal while another local company was to seize the houses in front of the arsenal as strangers poured in says anderson the enemy took positions round about so as to prevent any escape within shooting distance of the engine house and arsenal captain brown seeing their manoeuvres said we will hold on to our three positions if they are unwilling to come to terms and die like men End of section sixteen